series where we continue our exploration into the integration of behavioral science principles into coaching practices. In this episode of Mastering the Game Inside Coaching Minds, we're thrilled to have Coach Karras and Coach Fueline back with us so that we can go even deeper into behavioral science principles for optimizing athlete performance. Today, we're going to uncover invaluable insights and practical approaches that coaches can implement to empower athletes and enhance their success on and off the field. Let's continue with our conversation with Coach Cares and Coach Fueline. You talked about the need to self-evaluate, the need to be better yourself. So I'm curious to hear from both or either of you. How do you set goals and expectations to evaluate evaluate your own behaviors? What do we need to do as coaches? And then how do you instill that sense of self-evaluation or need for self-evaluation into your assistants or the people that are helping you? It's one thing to say, I can evaluate myself, but how do we get it so the people that are helping us build our programs have that same sense about their job and their role as well? I'll lead off on that. Uh, uh, I mentioned that I coach the quarterbacks and in, in, in a, a football program where you're going to pass the ball a lot, you've got to have an outstanding performance by your quarterback to be successful. So that was my responsibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that involved receivers protection, a lot of different parts of football. Uh, but I, I accepted that, you know, so. Uh, and I wanted the other coaches then to understand that I accept that as my responsibility. Hence, you have to accept the performance of the players at your position as your responsibility. So uh, <clears throat> we did not talk about what players can't do. We talked about what they could do. There might be some things that they don't do as well as other players. There, there might, might be, be some, some limitations, limitations that create problems for the performance of skills, but if, if, if they're, they're not real fast, fast they're not, not real agile, agile they're not real, real strong, I, I know that. Right. I'm aware of that. Let's, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to say that a player can't do A, B, or C because of these. He can do it to the best of his ability. So, number one, <clears throat> we're not going to be negative as we discuss players. We're going to be accountable for our teaching. So, so I had a, a statement that no learning equals no coaching. So uh, a position coach, if on film, uh, the quarterback threw a, uh, made a bad decision, threw a terrible pass. And I couldn't say I, I taught him not to do that. Clearly, I did not teach him not to do that because he just did it. And it's on videotape. There's proof that we made that error. I've got to coach better so that that won't happen again. So. When I watch videotape with young coaches here at Mount or elsewhere, and I see their players make a mistake, and they say, well, I've taught him that many times. My response is always, he hasn't learned it yet. He hasn't learned it well enough that in a game environment with the pressure on, that he performs the skill that you are trying to teach. You're the coach. You have to look for a better way to teach that skill be it different drills. Uh, uh, Maybe four out of five guys at the position learned it with the drill you're using and one didn't. Then improve as a coach so you you get across to the one. So I want, myself included, to be 100% responsible for teaching the skills that we say will go into making a football player at his position better. Very few excuses allowed. Yeah, I did a great job teaching. They didn't learn anything. That's just not going to make it. Right. We can't. We can't use that. Now, give an an illustration. You You said Mm self-evaluation. I reached a point in my career where we we had a good team. We played in a national semifinal, an away game, and uh, you make the case that the players on the field played extremely well. We lost. I went into the small press conference and a young reporter slid the quickie stats in front of me and said, before I had a chance to look at them, how's it feel to gain 601 yards, not punt and lose? Wow. That got a while out of you, didn't it? Mm -hmm. It sounds impossible. Right. 
I think the score was 28 to 23 or mm-hmm. in the 20s for both teams. Right. Uh, it, it, it almost got a while out of me. I was stunned. You know, right. uh, you don't realize what the stats are mm-hmm. when you're coaching a game. But I had to look at that and say, why is that? And I realized that the weakness was mine. Mm-hmm. We were not good enough as a goal line offensive team. Okay. I all in short mm-hmm. in improving my ability to create a goal line offense that would enable us to score the points that our yards gained should be leading to. So it was a tough self-evaluation because I could look back in my career and see games that I think we lost the game because I was deficient in that uh, uh, skill as a coach. Uh, it, but it led to changes. It led to me being more aware that as head coach, I had to evaluate myself and every assistant so that we wouldn't come up short. We frequently did, but it was not because of a lack of self-evaluation and a lack of being honest with ourselves in terms of what we could do better. We, We needed to seek more professional development opportunities. And I've I, I make that point with young coaches constantly. They say, what do you mean by professional development, Coach Karras? It might be as simple as calling a coach. Maybe you don't even know him. I've answered phone calls many times from a young coach who wanted to ask me a question, and I was, I felt good that the coach chose me to call. So I, I tell young people, when you call a veteran coach to ask a question, you make that coach feel good. That that you think he knows the answer and he'll share it with you. So professional development, which can be of necessity based on failure, is critical for us. We evaluate our players. We we constructively try to create a plan to help them improve, and we have to do it with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just great thoughts and, 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 you know, the, the evaluation of yourself, Coach Fuela and I have been talking about that all, all semester, about how do we look at ourselves, how do we set expectations, how does that trickle down to to our players? So, you know, Coach Fuel and I, in, in, in the modern, in this, in this modern world we're living in now, so much of competition is, uh, is driven by kind of like social pressures and, um things of that nature. So can you talk a little bit about what Coach Karras is saying here about self-evaluation and then explain a little bit about how do you make sure that that self-evaluation isn't determined by so- society and social pressures? Like how is how are you keeping it focused on you and not right. letting all that noise in sometimes? Is that something you do? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great, great question. question. You know, I, I think, think now um, more so than ever, ever you know, the need to to like coach said when you're self evaluating what do you evaluate right so um you know it's taken me a while to you know sure the fun part is always you know taking a program that's down and building it up right everyone thinks you're great you know everything you do is the self evaluations are glowing you yeah. know for all of us to be able to sustain that like this man did Mm -hmm. is at a whole it's a whole different level like i can't even it's it's um exhausting it's you know you just get so much more respect for the process i mean it's 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 you know it's almost tough to deal with you know at times um but but getting to that point is enjoyable right because you, you know it's it's just all all roses. Mm-hmm. But I think when you self-evaluate, I'm at the point in my career where I know my failures throughout the season. Mm-hmm. My what where I sometimes fail is just because I had a team that did this a year or two ago that somehow this team is just going to understand what we did and it's just going to flow that way. Um, the one thing that I've learned is that every team is certainly going to be different. Um, the behaviors that you're going to have to have with each team has changed. The team I coached this year, we had to use a few behavior techniques that we had never really had to use in the last four or five years. And that frustrated me. But instead of, you know, 
I think that stuck with me, you know, and, and, it, and it bothered me. Um, instead of just being able to adapt to that and understand this is this is just a different year. Um, you know, it's easy to blame those players in that situation. But at some point as a coach, you have to be able to evaluate that. So so what is the evaluation? Like, what is the self-evaluation? What's the program evaluation? You know, I, I was around it's a national championship, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's right. inside me. I'm at that, I'm at a place where that is, you know, that's fairly important, you know? So, you know, my evaluation of myself and our program uh, will never get to that point, but I think it needs to have the same questions asked, you know, coach made a great comment to me today. He doesn't even know he probably, he said it. You know, because you get to a point, even in your own program, where you're like, okay, like like he said, like uh, he's on the plane. I'm going to give a quick story. It's 2012. No, no one knows it's his last year. Maybe the sense of it, you know, whatever. We had lost a stag boy, I think, three years prior to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and here he comes, man. And I'm not joking. Every day in the summer. When I would go talk to him and have that coffee, he's in front of a TV and he's watching Oregon mm-hmm. football. Okay. Every hour of every day of writing things down. And you want to talk about like feeling this big as a coach, right? Mm-hmm. I think at the time I'm 37 years old and this guy is out working everyone times a hundred, right? So he had made the comment to me, you know, we, he just, rebooted his own program mm-hmm. this is how we're going to do things this is how we're gonna, and we obviously won a national championship that year you know that's motivating for me right. i think nowadays part of the self-evaluation is i need to go get another job i need to go do this well how about just reboot your own this is your new job right reboot right. your own job um and there's some fun into that right there's some excitement mm-hmm. into that and um you know i think that's the point where we're at right now mm-hmm. It's something to look, you know, kind of look forward to. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 great insight, and, and I think that probably what's also important for younger, younger coaches, coaches to hear that might not have attained that level is that you're going to have to find your successes where they're at right now and where they're attainable, and then build on that from year to year. You know, it's great to come in with national championship, you know, aspirations, but we also have to live in the reality of the world that we're at. The, the, the kids we have on our team, and then what we know our limitations are. So um, it's awesome that you guys are at that level, but for some of the coaches that might be listening that are just starting to build programs, or for me, I'm, I'm a youth coach, so I, I don't have a championship to play for, but what I have to play for is each kid gets better at their skill, at their position every season, and then we're growing because what we're trying to do are develop athletes that are going to fit into your programs, your championship programs, and are going to contribute. So um, I think all coaches can take something from what you guys are talking about. And I, I want to switch a little bit back to something that you said earlier, Coach Karras. You told us about how you plan to make your quarterback better. So I want to know, what do you think having competitors in or having spectators in the arena does to your athletes and what are you doing from a behavioral aspect to make sure that when there's the game on the line when the stadium's packed that those athletes are ready to perform and is that ever anything that you give a thought to sure i mean lots of thought great uh, uh a lot yeah a lot of thought uh, because of the development of skill that's one thing mm-hmm. uh, and as a young coach and, and working with youth, I think you primarily are concerned with the how do I teach the skills? I know you work with young lacrosse players. Mm-hmm. How do you teach a young man to, from the time he picks up a lacrosse stick to be able to catch the ball and throw the ball right. and pick up a ground ball? Uh, that Those are hard skills with a lacrosse stick in your hand. And how do you do that? That's, that's, that's a, a challenge, challenge in and of itself. itself. And I think it's it's essential that we master the, first of all, what are the key skills at every position in the sport you're coaching? And at Mount Union Football, there are five for every position. A young man knows 
how we're going to evaluate him in practice each day, how we would evaluate his high school videotape when he comes to visit us, uh, how we evaluate his performance in a game, because it's very consistent. It's been identified, and uh, occasionally we shuffle the five around a little bit, but no drastic changes. Uh, the control, though, how do you get the best out of your athletes when the lights come on on right. Friday night, when the spectators are in the crowd? What if it's a bigger crowd? I once took my team up to, we played lacrosse at Madison, at the University of Lacrosse, at their stadium, mm -hmm. which seats 90,000. How are we going to perform in front of 87,000 empty seats? You know, maybe 3,000 will be full, but in a, that environment, Great. you know, will well, tension mm -hmm. uh, undermine us? Well, I think the answer is you have to create and I use the word chaos mm -hmm. at times in practice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have to create tension, anxiety, somehow, some way to cause an athlete to have some of the emotions that he might have in front of a crowd in a playoff game, in a, in a, in a big event. And, I had to think through, how do you do that? What can I do to produce that type of tension? But as as time went on and as the years went by, I improved right. in my ability to do that. Uh, I feel like practice goes like this in terms of intensity and effort, mm -hmm. and that the student athletes need to know what parts of practice in the mind of the coaches am I expected to be at my very best in terms of, you know, we can't practice football for two hours running full speed every time. We tire out, wouldn't be able to produce anything. So the team needs to know that, and then they need to perform accordingly during during that. They need to meet the expectations you've set for them then, because that's a critical evaluation time. I don't want to find out on Saturday that you can't be in control of yourself when the game starts, I want to find that out in practice if that's an issue and deal with it in practice. So I think as coaches, if we think long and hard enough, we can figure out how to produce practice environments that simulate game environments. Uh, so uh, everything, I think, as a coach, we have to accept the responsibility of thinking if that's an issue, then I can solve it. Right. Because anything short of that, you'll just blame losses on, well, too many people came. The lights were too, you know, the golf commercial where everything's wrong and a guy can't. Yeah, you, you'll just keep making excuses. Right. We didn't get the job done because right. their their band was too loud and we, we couldn't hear the signal. That, you know. right. No. Produce tension, produce anxiety in practice. Yeah. Uh, so your players learn how to deal with it. And you know, honestly, at times I had to almost fake mm -hmm. that I was upset that we, we made too many. I mean, right. but I would fake it. Yeah. And I think the players learned to trust the idea that if I'm upset, he thinks our performance is not good enough. We can't, we, we're not going to win. We're not going to be successful. Right. And uh, that was the, the best way that I knew to prepare young guys for what you're saying, you know, the game, yeah. uh, the crowd. Uh, yeah, so what I'm hearing you tell me, Coach, is that not only are you paying attention to the behavioral aspects of your athletes, but of yourself. Like the self-awareness that I'm hearing in your response is just amazing to me. You, you're using behavioral science principles not only to coach young people, but to coach yourself and the people that are around you. Is that accurate? Sure. I had a player tell me after he graduated that he knew – that when I did that, oh. we were a little, the team was a little short of where I thought they ought to be at that particular po point in practice. And mm -hmm. he, he, as a senior leader, wanted to change that before, you know, before things progressed any further. I mean, right. he, he could read my body language. We think we can read the body language of athletes in terms of how they're carrying themselves. You know, I... I, I said to my wife at a recent contest, uh, you, you notice the body language of number six or something like that, you know, and, uh, 
well, athletes have that same ability to pay attention. So if they can read, and then that's going to lead to senior leaders, right? Eliciting more effort, more concentration, more focus out of their teammates, then ooh, let's use that to control behavior, right? to get the behavior where we skill, effort, whatever it is, where we want it to be. Uh, Mike used the word effort in his last talk. I want to make a comment on that. Mm -hmm. As an assistant coach, the head coach said to me, he was the defensive coach, uh, the, the performance of the scout team, the group of guys that run the plays of our opponents, it's not what it needs to be. He was, he was upset with that. Okay. I said, well, what, do, what do we want them to do? And we decided we wanted them to not talk in the huddle, look at the card of the play they're supposed to run and do it. Mm -hmm. Get the cadence right. Line up in the correct formation. We wanted the skill guys to do what was drawn on the card. He and I both knew that the D-line varsity mm -hmm. couldn't just knock the scout team line out of the way and destroy the play. Okay. They had to have a controlled rate of speed. And then five, we wanted to play every 40 seconds. Okay. So I measured them. Got a couple of students from my class to come out and measure it. And for three practices, we were below 25% in those five skills. So I, I said to these 30 players on the, maybe 32 players on the offensive scout team next week, if you can get to 75% on these five skills at the end of Thursday's practice, when we've got the data, if we do that, we'll put your names in a hat, we'll pick two of you out, you get to play in the game Saturday. Oh, uh -huh. uh, yeah. I got uh, out of you. Uh -huh. and you're not a... 20 year old, mm -hmm. we get to play in the game. Well, that was a, a lottery. Yeah. A lottery for playing time, yeah. which is what? Right. If yeah. you said 100% of the guys on the team want playing time, you're, you're pretty close to it, right? Yeah. There might be somebody out there that doesn't care, but most of them care. And they change their behavior dramatically, <clears throat> knowing that they had a one in 16 chance of playing in the game. And uh, the defensive coach, who happened to be the head coach, felt that that improvement in the performance of the, the offensive scout team was significant, worthy of two names getting in the game Saturday. Right. Now, by putting two players who weren't as talented as others into the game, did, would it decrease our chances of winning? Not if we did it carefully. Right. Not if we did it carefully enough. Right. So effort. Uh, we 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 have to we have at our disposal tools to in, increase the effort of most young men on our team if we use them and it's it's the use of positive things that they want right. your your recognition your praise the, the, their name on the board for what they did uh, and in this case you're going to be in the game call grandma and grandpa and tell them right I still remember the names of those two players and that was in the late seventies. Thanks for tuning in again to part two of our interview with Coach Larry Karras on Mastering the Game Inside Coaching Minds. We trust that you found Coach Karras and Coach Fuline's insights valuable. Stay tuned for our final episode where we'll finish our discussion on integrating behavioral science into coaching and enhancing athlete performance. Don't miss out on more insights from our esteemed guests. Keep listening as we explore great coaching minds together.